The Power Rangers are the perfect candidates for video games. A team of superheroes with flashy weapons, fighting off evil monsters, and controlling a giant robot. Complete with a rockin' soundtrack, theoretically, all Power Rangers games should be loads of fun. But are they? That's the question I asked myself when I decided to make this video. As a lifelong Power Rangers fan, I've played my fair share of games throughout my life, but today, I wanted to challenge myself and play every single Power Rangers video game. The TV show has always varied in quality. Would the video games also follow this trend? Were they able to create new potential fans of the series if they only ever played the games? Would they remove a game off the Xbox Store for no reason, making it lost media, TM? Well, let's find out. First game on our list is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers on the Sega Genesis. And just listen to that wonderful blast processing. So the game actually has a story, but it's about as deep as, well, Mighty Morphin Season 1. Rita wants to destroy the Rangers and sends down monsters to get the job done. You get to choose between the core five Rangers as your playable character. I don't know why they're trapped in this void, but it's not important. What is important is the gameplay. The game is a 2D fighter, similar to Street Fighter. Being on the Sega Genesis means that there's limited buttons. You can throw a punch, a kick, and do some button combinations for some special moves. Honestly, it's not great. The combat is really slow, and the hitboxes are really small. You have to be right up in someone's grill just so you can land one or two punches. Every attack either backs up your opponent or knocks them to the ground completely, so you're spending a lot of time readjusting and missing attacks. The Rangers also all play exactly the same. They have one special ability that has them bust out their weapons, but it's all just different variations of a slash attack. But despite the core gameplay being... yeah, there's enough variation and fan service to keep a young fan invested. For example, most fights in a fighting game go for two rounds. Here though, once you beat the monster in your Ranger form, Rita makes the monster grow. And round two has you doing battle as the Megazord. So you're pretty much forced to adapt to the enemy's attacks and act accordingly with a whole new character each time. That, plus having cutscenes interspersed between each fight, keeps it fresh. For example, after beating the Minotaur, your second opponent is now Tommy under Rita's spell. So you gotta fight him in the Dragon Zord. Once you beat them, though, you now unlock him as a playable character, where you'll naturally choose him. So now, despite the third fight being another monster on the same highway stage, yeah, this is the only stage when you're not in the Megazord fights, it at least feels fresh because you have a new character in Megazord at your disposal. The game's not perfect, but having Megazord fights, an unlockable character, and cutscenes definitely adds value to it. It's also super short. The only other fight left are Goldar, Giant Goldar, and Cyclopsis, who you fight in your Megazord. No joke, I beat this game in 15 minutes. Yeah. Victory! Roll credits. Special thanks to... <laughs> unemployed? Wait, are you referring to me? Now, the best thing about the 16-bit console wars of the 90s is that if a game was released on one console, you can bet your kidney that the rival console would have one right around the corner. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers on the Super Nintendo, and just listen to that 16-bit theme song. It sounds so good, how could it get better? Alright, we've peaked early with the best game. The story is, once again the same. Rita lights Angel Grove on fire and we gotta save it. This character select screen is so clean. Seriously, did the Super Nintendo version get all the budget? The game is a side-scrolling beat-em-up. Now, full transparency, I played this game all the time as a kid, so I might be a bit more... blindly in love. Every stage has you start off as a ranger in their human form, all of which have unique fighting styles. Jason is a straightforward fighter, Zack's moveset is more wild and flashy, and Billy... he does this. I always loved playing as the rangers in their human forms because, yeah, they can hold their own without their powers, that's partially why they were chosen in the first place. You can chain together basic combos by matching the attack button, along with a jump kick and suplex. Brutal. Halfway through the stage you'll encounter a boss, where... It's time. You morph and lay the smack down on the putties, all while the theme song continues to play in the background. It's crazy how well they captured the hype of the show in video game form. When playing as the Ranger, not much has changed. Your punch has now been replaced with a weapon. The only downside is that now all the characters play the same. 
Hit, 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 final slash. Hit, 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 final slash. Even Kimberly does that with her bow and arrow. Speaking of the same, goodness Kimberly, you been hitting the gym or what? Yeah, all the Rangers are just reskinned Jasons, but those are all just minor nitpicks that don't really matter. The game is tons of fun regardless. The boss battles have a lot of fluid movements and really keep you on your toes. Seriously, look at this. I'm swinging my sword around and jumping off the walls like a madman. They nailed the combat perfectly. The platforming, on the other hand, well, that shouldn't be there. There's luckily not a lot of it, but the parts that do require some precision jumping are really frustrating. Strategy time! During the level 2 boss battle, just stand on this platform and don't even bother hunting him down. Hey, whoa, 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 can you back up a bit, sir? Theme song aside, this game has some really rockin' music. It is peak Super Nintendo. It's another short game, but it gets pretty difficult. Once you reach the final two stages, though, business is about to pick up. Of course there would be a dinosaur fight. It's great. Every attack you land feels and sounds impactful. You got all these special abilities that charge up and you just launch them at the enemy. Man, a Megazord fighting game sounds amazing. I can't recommend this game enough. A++. Continuing our Mighty Morphin journey, we got the Game Boy version. Whoa, what's up with these faces? What do the kids call this? Analog horror? Yeah, they all got analog horror face. This is about what I expected. You walk from left to right and punch the bad guys. You got one attack, and since this is the OG Game Boy, there's no color. Meaning you have five characters who are all literally exactly the same in every way. Now hey, this is great if we're fighting Psycho Blue, but we're not. So it's mid. But how does the competition square up? Mighty Morphin Power Rangers on Sega Game Gear. Now, I'm not a one percenter, so I never owned this thing as a kid. Is it better than the Game Boy version? Well, yeah. Hell, it's honestly a little better than the Sega Genesis version. The game is kind of a 2D fighter. Putties will spawn, but you get locked in this fighting game stance. Meaning if you back up, your character doesn't fully turn around and run away like in a side-scroller. You're instead constantly facing the opponent like any fighting game. After whooping some putties, the stage boss will fly in and you gotta fight. The combat is much more smooth and combo friendly than its console counterpart. You can actually land some fancy looking moves here. The inputs are snappy and super responsive. I have never played a Game Gear game up until this point. Are all the games on the console this clean? I expected it to be much slower, but it might be the fastest of the bunch so far, including the Super Nintendo. You got a punch, kick, uppercut, jumping kick, as well as button combinations for special abilities. The game's also laid out like the Genesis game. Fight a monster, then fight it again in the Megazord. Rinse and repeat. GamePro Magazine at the time described the game as a satisfying blend of action and adventure, perfect for beginners. And yeah, that checks out. If you're a kid, you can definitely just button mash your way pretty far. That is until you reach Tommy. Jesus Christ, this guy would not let me breathe. The AI goes insane here, constantly overwhelming you with attack after attack. It's surprisingly good. I was expecting garbage to be honest. How many cases are there of a handheld version outshining the console version in every way? I'm curious to know. Leave some examples in the comments. <sighs> and I guess I technically have to mention this game. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers on the Sega CD. The Sega CD lauded itself as the first console to show full motion video in its games. So here, they literally just ripped an episode from the TV show, crunched it down to 15p, and threw in some DDR inputs over the screen and called it a day. But why this is stupid is because regardless of your inputs, the episode continues. During a fight, if the Rangers get hit in the show, they get hit no matter what, regardless of what you do. The screen shakes a little bit if you miss an input, but who cares? Hey, here's an idea. Turn on any episode of Power Rangers, and go on your phone and scroll Instagram. That's pretty much the experience you'll be getting here. What a stupid and pointless game. 1995 would see Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Movie, featuring Ivan Ooze. It's a charming, campy film that I personally like, but I do have to admit it's absolutely garbage. 
but a movie's a movie, and it came with tons of games. Starting off with the Sega Genesis, we got Mighty Morphin Power Rangers the Movie. The game. You start off, of course, by picking a ranger, and... Oh, cool! The game is an arcade-style beat-em-up, a format perfect for the show. I'm surprised there was never a Power Rangers arcade cabinet like the Ninja Turtles and X-Men. You move around the stage and beat up the bad guys. It's about as simple as simple can get. Wait, that music. You recognize it? No way! A Power Rangers game finally uses some Ron Wasserman tracks. You got Fight, We Need a Hero, 541, Combat, they're all here in their glorious, grungy Sega Genesis sound. The game loosely follows the plot of the movie, and by loosely, boy goodness gracious do I mean loosely. The next cutscene follows the movie. Ivan destroys Zordon's tube and the Rangers need to go to another planet to find new powers. So naturally, level 2 are the city streets. Okay. Where the boss battle are the two Megazords Ivan Ooze creates. Yeah, we're fighting his Megazords. May I remind you, this is only level 2 and we have already reached the absolute end point of the movie. Now, I was initially a little miffed by this, but what happens next made me absolutely fall in love with the game, and I thought it was a better choice than following the movie. We defeat the evil Megazords and the Rangers reminisce about when they first joined the team where we then get to play a flashback mission where Rocky, Adam, and Aisha get replaced with Jason, Zack, and Trini. Saber Tooth Tiger! Saber Tiger! How dare you deceive me. Hey, speaking of wrong voice clips, earlier I was playing as Adam, but his "haya" sounds sound exactly like Zack. Anyway, yeah, these flashback missions don't really matter since we're only playing as the ranger form and everyone plays the same, but it's still a charming touch. Even the Megazord fight has us go from the Ninja Zord to the Thunder Zord. The best way to experience this game, just like with any arcade beat-em-up, is with a friend. There's times where this definitely got a bit too repetitive for its own good. The first two levels had me fighting waves of three Oozlings every single time. There was no variety with the numbers or enemy type the same basic enemy for every screen. A friend's presence really would have made this game a bit more enjoyable. Could you imagine you and a buddy fighting evil as the Thunder Zord and Tiger Zord together? Unfortunately, uh, you know, all my friends were busy. Yeah, it's crazy. They go to different schools. You'll probably never see them. Oh, and don't even get me started on this cave level. I spent a good, no joke, 10 minutes straight just beating up the putties. There's a timer that ran out quickly, but the level didn't end, so I genuinely thought my game glitched. You're watching the footage in its entirety at like, 5 times speed. So I ran all the way back and realized I was supposed to punch this random, unassuming rock to open up a secret path. What?! Regardless, it's a great game for the fans. The music, the gameplay, the friendship. I also think this is the only Power Rangers game to include all 9 Mighty Morphin Rangers in a playable form. I think the game may have been a bit better if you remove the movie tie-in altogether and just do a History of Mighty Morphin. Yeah, where you start off with the Season 1 team and work your way all the way up to Season 3, going from the Dino Powers, Thunder Zords, and Ninja Powers respectively. Highly recommend it. Alright, moving over to the SNES version, let's see what they got up their sleeve. It's once again co-op and we get to pick our Ranger. Why does Billy look like that? When in the history of the show has Billy looked like this? So the game seems to be trying to capture the magic of the first game. It's a side-scrolling action game, but one of the strangest ones I've played. Mainly because you play on two different planes. Hitting the L or R button, you'll move from the top half of the screen to the bottom, and vice versa. I guess this makes sense since the game is multiplayer. You could have your friend up high and you down low, but it just ends up feeling kind of unnecessary and cumbersome. You also don't have combos anymore, just one single strike you do over and over again. It feels like they couldn't decide whether to have the game be similar to the first SNES title or an arcade beat-em-up, so here we get this weird hybrid. I don't know why they just didn't opt for an arcade beat-em-up like the Sega Genesis version. Could you imagine a Turtles in Time-like game with the Power Rangers on Super Nintendo? Every time you defeat an enemy, they'll drop a lightning bolt. Collecting enough, you'll fill up this meter, and once it's completely full, you hit the X button and you'll morph. I do like how you're in control of the morphing, meaning you could challenge yourself if you want to play the game fully in human form. 
I also struggled way too much with this one. There's a lot of precise jumping and dodging you'll have to do, but the margin for error is so small and 9 times out of 10 I end up getting hit because I didn't perfectly dodge something. I think if you're playing with a friend though, a lot of these critiques wouldn't matter. Co-op Power Rangers is always bound to be a great time. I just need, like, friends. It's weird because I prefer the Sega Genesis version of the movie game in every way, apart from the visuals, which is where the Super Nintendo version shines. I love how gorgeous this game is, but I don't really love the gameplay. It also doesn't follow the movie at all until the very end. At least the Genesis one tried a little bit. Here we're going to random stages that never appear in the movie and fight putties. I know I'm kinda dogging on the game a lot, but I do genuinely enjoy it. It's loads of fun. Typical Power Rangers fan, complains about the product incessantly, and ends it with, I love this, 10 out of 10. Heading back to the world of handhelds, we got Power Rangers the movie the game on Game Boy. Goodness. So, just like the last Game Boy game, you walk from left to right and punch the putties. That's it. Again, all the rangers are exactly the same. I can't even say palette swap because there's no palette. Look at this. You see this? This is what you'll be doing the entire time. You got this random assortment of punches and kicks your ranger will throw out. I don't know if there's a pattern, but it doesn't feel like it. And when you morph, nothing changes. It's the same punches and kicks as before. So what's the point in morphing if I'm not any stronger? I also couldn't get past level 2 because I reached this part where when you drop off platforms, you immediately get shot by a cannon. It's stupid because it's a drop of faith. You can't see anything below you or prepare for an attack. Stupid game. And the final game in the Mighty Morphin The Movie The Game series is on the Game Gear. But, wait, this is looking kind of familiar. Yeah, this is the exact same game as the first Game Gear title. Pick a ranger, fight off hordes of putties and monsters in a fighting game style hybrid. And then you do a Megazord battle. Well, I guess I don't really have to spend much time on it. At least it's a good game. This is kind of like their Pokemon Red and Blue. Two games that are exactly the same, but do you prefer the Green Ranger and the Dinozords, or the White Ranger and the Thunderzords? Decisions, decisions. Speaking of the White Ranger, Jesus Tommy, what did they do to you? He looks like someone's drunk uncle. His fat belly and this wife beater and his balding head. The Ranger known for having the longest hair? Okay. Now, just like the Power Rangers fanbase, I'm sure you're sick of hearing about Mighty Morphin. However, we do have just one more game to talk about before moving on. At least, for now. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Fighting Edition. Yeah, the Super Nintendo had its own Power Rangers 2D fighter to rival the Genesis. Was it any good? Oh, you bet it's good because it's specifically a giant mech fighting game. That's right, you can choose between the Thunder Zord, Tiger Zord, and even the Ninja Zord and Shogun Zord, and you'll do battle with the villains throughout the show in their giant forms. What I really love is the fact that even though we're playing as giant robots, the movements and attacks are still insanely quick and snappy. Like, I've definitely never seen a Megazord move like this. And despite being fast paced, the attacks still feel like they have some serious impact. The heavy strikes feel weighty and the sound design is really satisfying. The Super Nintendo was littered with Street Fighter clones, but this one actually stands out from the bunch. Even a non-Power Rangers fan would have fun with it. Fast combos, button inputs for special moves, quick reaction times, it's all here. And that final fight with Lord Zed, Jesus Christ, he does not mess around. You really have to lock in and be one with the Thunderzord. My only complaint is, where's the Dinozord and Dragonzord? You have all the other Megazords here, why not include those two as unlockable characters after beating the game or something? Ultimately, that's just a minor complaint from an annoying fanboy. As a whole, it's hard to say which is the best Mighty Morphin game for this era. If you have a friend, then I definitely recommend the Genesis movie game for co-op and the SNES fighting game for Versus. But as a single player experience, the first Super Nintendo game is probably the way to go. Alright, finally getting a break from the Mighty Morphin Vortex brings us to Power Rangers Zeo Battle Racers on the Super Nintendo. 
Yeah, a Power Rangers racing game. That's different. You can select between the core five rangers, the gold ranger, King Mondo, and a cog. Now, I want you to look at this game for 10 seconds and tell me if it seems familiar. This is not even a tribute or an inspiration. The game is a legit Super Mario Kart ripoff. Like, what other racing game splits the screen in half to show you your rear view? The first level is a typical go-kart track with these red and white barriers. When you cross the finish line, the camera whips around your character and they throw their hands up in the air and celebrate. Level 2 is literally a beach that looks exactly like the one in Mario Kart. The only difference is instead of item boxes, your character has six shots you can use to blast the racer in front of you. I mean, what else can I say? It literally feels like a ROM hack as opposed to an official game. It controls well, has solid drifting, really catchy music. I mean, if you ever wanted Super Mario Kart DLC, then here you go. I'm surprised not a lot of people talk about this game when mentioning Mario Kart clones. A blatant ripoff that's still begrudgingly fun. Then we have Power Rangers Zeo vs. the Machine Empire on PC. You humans are such fools. The Machine Empire is here, and it is here forever. <laughs> it's not even close to King Mondo's voice. Welcome, Welcome Rangers. Rangers. You, you have arrived, arrived just in time. time. A, new A new evil is threatening the planet Earth. And nope, that's not Zordon either. The game is pretty basic, move from left to right and punch the cogs. It is very janky and visually pretty ugly, but I have a soft spot for late 90s PC games. Like, this kind of feels like a bootleg. It's not good by any stretch of the imagination, but I've never heard of this game until doing research for this video, so it's at least got that mysterious factor to it. It's just this, by the way. The entire game is jankily moving around and platforming while getting into awkward fights that don't feel satisfying to win. Congratulations! Power Rangers Zeo Full Tilt Pinball. Oh boy. You flip the paddles, hit the ball, I'm sure you know how pinball works. I'm not too sure what I'm doing though. Like, naturally I assumed I had to hit the ball at the cogs on the monster. However, when I did, nothing would happen. The cogs would respawn and the monster seemed unfazed. So I gave up trying to figure out what to do and just let the vibes take the controller. I mean, the game is fine, it's pinball, I don't hate pinball, but I'd rather play it on a physical cabinet or on a Windows XP computer. There's a part where I somehow summon the Megazord, and I was like, alright, what a finisher! They really make a showy finale. So during the cutscene, I put the controller down to look at my phone, but when I looked back up, the game wasn't over. Like, excuse me? It's Power Rangers tradition that when the Megazord does the big move, it's all over. The game literally went on for another 30 seconds before I got the victory screen. The boss battles are more straightforward. Okay, I literally just have to hit the ball at the big enemy. The problem with this though is there's no pageantry or special abilities or anything. So it's pretty boring just trying to hit the ball at this one big thing. Overall though, it's fine. It's definitely... pinball. After this, there'd be a bit of a drought in terms of Power Rangers games. Nothing for Turbo, In Space, or Lost Galaxy. Yeah, the car season didn't get a racing game. However, in 2000, we'd get Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue on the N64. This intro is so hilarious to me. It's a slideshow of what seems to be MS Paint fan art while the theme song plays in the lowest and crunchiest quality I've ever heard. Since the N64 can't handle cutscenes, we instead get comic panels. You are not Captain Mitchell, and you are definitely not Miss Fairweather. And this damn theme keeps restarting every time I enter a new screen. Like, I love the Lightspeed Rescue theme, but when it's cut off every 10 seconds and sounds like absolute death, No. Anyway, so how's the game itself? 
It's trash. Yeah, Lightspeed on N64 is infamous for being one of the worst games of all time. You start off by playing as Kelsey and you have two attack buttons. One shoots a sparkling light forward and the other backwards. Level 1 has you going around blasting at green ooze. Yep, stationary green ooze. Doesn't attack you or anything. Yay! Even the programmed audience couldn't sound excited. Level 2 has us playing as Carter and his fire truck. We have to shoot water at cars on the road that are on fire. Which apparently it's a bad day for cars since there's a ton of them going up in flames. Which is why I guess we gotta do a drive-by shooting as opposed to maybe actually stopping and helping them out. The main issue with this section is that the fire truck is in the middle of the screen as opposed to being completely on the left, like a normal game might do. So because of this, you sometimes just don't have enough time to react properly. That, plus the janky controls, literally makes it impossible to save some cars. Carter Grayson would never. The next level is a Megazord fight. And they did it. They somehow made the worst possible Megazord battle I've ever experienced in a game so far. You're in this first person perspective shooting missiles. That's your only attack. And the enemy can strafe out of your sight really fast. So you're spending most of the time trying to line up your shots so they land. It's really disorienting and boring. Oh yeah, did I show you the epic Megazord transformation? Mwah. This game definitely deserves its awful reputation. Most of the game has you doing these beat em up sections, shooting laser beams at enemies. This is how stupid this game gets. I was trying to make progress so I can go to Mariner Bay, or I'm sorry, city, but I couldn't progress. Because not only do you need to defeat every battling, but you also need to destroy the trees. Yes, I'm not kidding. You cannot progress until you break all the trees in this park. What is going on? This is the first genuinely terrible Power Rangers game we've checked out so far. Even as a fanboy, I can't find one good thing about it. Apart from maybe getting to hear the Lightspeed theme song. That's it. A repetitive, broken, and janky experience through and through. Heading over to the PS1, we once again have Lightspeed Rescue. Being on a more technologically advanced console hopefully means we're in for a better experience. Once you arrive at the building, we will be able to track you via your rescue morphers. That's definitely Miss Fairweather's voice, but not her face. What we have here is a simple 3D arcade style beat em up. Go around the stage, rescue civilians, collect random doodads, and punch and kick the crap out of every battling in your vicinity. The combat isn't very satisfying. You can't string together any combos and the hit detection is garbage. You'll essentially just be mashing the X or circle button and hoping your health bar is more than the enemies. The first boss you'll encounter is Shockatron, and you can see with your own eyes the strategy I implemented. The combat is not very deep. The whole game isn't good, but I won't really say it's bad either. It's more so just boring. What you're seeing here is what you'll be doing from the start until the end. However, the game is co-op. So maybe if you were a kid with a younger sibling and you had this game, it wouldn't be terrible. I wouldn't recommend it at all. But it's not the worst light speed game. Which isn't saying much. And the final light speed rescue game left to check out is on the Game Boy Color. So this game is kind of interesting conceptually. Usually in Power Rangers games, you're focusing on beating up the bad guys because, well, it's fun. But here we have a focus on rescuing people. We need to explore this really big building and use different tools and abilities to rescue civilians. Break down the doors, use drills and grabby claws to reach people you can't normally. It's interesting for about three minutes. Then you start to realize just how much aimless wandering you're doing. This area is massive and you don't have a map or anything, so there's a lot of aimless adventuring. The game looks like it's broken up into three parts, rescuing, fighting, and Megazord battle. However, I never got to experience the other two modes because I couldn't find all the civilians. And I definitely was not looking up a guide for Power Rangers Lightspeed Rescue on Game Boy. I'll give it kudos for not just resorting to being another side-scrolling beat-em-up, but it's not very fun in my opinion. All right, so now it's time for... Time Force! Power Rangers Time Force on PS1. The game is exactly the same as Lightspeed on PS1, a weird 3D beat-em-up you can play with a friend. However, I gotta give out about this one a bit. Firstly, level one in any video game is supposed to be fairly easy, right? So, okay, why is the first level in this game so frustrating? 
You need to scale this mountain that has giant rocks falling down. However, there's no indication on when one's coming. Now sound effect or visual indicator. You're just scaling the mountain and boom, big rock hits you. Normally I wouldn't mind taking my time, but there's a time limit and a fairly short one by the sounds of it. So I'm rushing. And of course the platforming is garbage. If you're not pixel perfect, you're falling down. And, and then probably getting hit with a rock. And to add insult to injury on top of all of that, anytime you do literally anything, Circuit pauses the game to interrupt you and give you a tutorial. Rangers, the time villains have traveled back here to the 21st century. These bonuses will stop the countdown briefly. Watch out, Ranger! Well done! Great! Well done! I love you, Circuit, but Jesus, please shut up! I also learned that the timer doesn't matter. It reached zero for me and just counted into the negatives. Apparently, if you beat the stage within the three minute time limit, then you'll be rewarded with health bonuses. Why add this random time limit feature? Is it because this is Power Rangers Time Force? Apart from probably the most frustrating level one I've ever had to play, the game is exactly the same as Lightspeed. Same pros and cons. Punch your way through Cyclobots with a buddy if you want. Here you go. Alrighty, here's Time Force on the Game Boy Advance, made by Vicarious Visions? Hey, these guys have actually made games. The opening already has me sold, I'm in love. We get a Game Boy rendition of the Time Force theme song in karaoke form, along with these charming visuals. Timeless wonders are a thunder? Wait, is it not fire and thunder? The game itself is another side-scrolling beat-em-up. Being on the GBA though, it's definitely the best looking and most fluid in terms of gameplay. You can double jump and use more abilities. Apart from that, not much else to comment on. No other deep mechanics or crazy features we're missing out on. Just walk around the stage and beat up the baddies. Definitely the best handheld ranger game so far. Sticking to the GBA, we've got Power Rangers Wild Force. This title screen music kicks so much ass, but I don't think it's the Wild Force theme. <laughs> You start off by selecting your ranger you'll take control of, and three others as supports. I really like the art style of the rangers, very muscular but slim. Unlike those toys in the 90s, what kind of steroids were they taking? The game is once again very basic, walk around the stage and beat up the putrids. The game utilizes an isometric view which is pretty unique, you mash the attack button until the cows come home. Hitting the shoulder buttons will summon the other rangers for their special abilities. For example, with Cole and Alyssa you'll go on a berserk charge and nothing will stand in your way and Danny will pick you up and throw you like a shot put. The boss battles essentially require you to use these abilities to weaken them before you start smacking them around. The Megazord battles are interesting. Basically, you're on the defense at all times. The enemy will do an attack and you have to do like this DDR Mario and Luigi RPG, tap the buttons at the right time in order to counterattack. It's interesting, I'll give it that. Now, normally this is probably where I'd wrap up on this game. It's another very simple but enjoyable action game. However, Power Rangers Wild Force on GBA has multiplayer, and not just two players or even three, full on four player co-op. Yes, this is the four swords of Power Rangers games. I guess that's why this game has an isometric view, it lets you see your teammates easier. Also, the Megazord sequence has four panels here, so theoretically it would actually be a team effort for everyone to hit the right buttons when it's their turn to beat the monster. I didn't expect this game to be as deep and unique as it is. If you're by yourself, I probably wouldn't recommend it, but if you have some friends, it makes for a good time. Probably. Alright, here's Power Rangers Ninja Storm, also on the Game Boy Advance, with not their theme song. You start out by selecting your group. You can either play as the Wind Rangers, Thunderstorm Rangers, or the Green Samurai Ranger. I tried out all the different teams and they all play relatively the same and follow the same story. The game, to no one's surprise, is another side-scrolling action game. Move from left to right and beat up the bad guys. However, this is definitely the best of the Game Boy Bunch so far, mainly because it focuses on just being a beat-em-up. Yeah, all the other games had a focus on fighting too, but sprinkled in elements of exploration and platforming which in my opinion bogs down the already limited experience, so here just focusing on punch 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 works best. 
It feels like a bit of a spiritual successor to the first Super Nintendo Mighty Morphin game. Every ranger uses their weapons and can string together combos. You can slash, shoot your blaster, and even throw enemies. There's even some barriers that can only be destroyed by you hucking a body at it. It's really fun. The Megazord fights are also pretty engaging. You have to press the button along with the corresponding direction in a short time. So, for example, if the A button appears on the left side, you need to press A and left on the D-pad. If it's on the top, then B plus up on the D-pad. So forth and so on. The GBA is limited in terms of power, so it's a good alternative. That's pretty much it. This is like our 20th side-scrolling action game. Oh, hell yeah, Dino Thunder, play that rockin' theme song! That's not it. Whoa, slow down, Connor. What happened? That's also not Jason David Frank. Yikes. I can already see where this game is going. Zeltrax sent a new giant army to attack the Zords! Wait, no way. Are you kidding? Connor and Ethan are also voiced by the same guy as Tommy. Why not just use, I don't know, the Dino Thunder actors? Kira, Ethan, do you read me? Dr. O, we're low on power. This may be our last transmission. On my way, Dr. O. I'll get him back. You can count on it. In this game, we take control of the individual Zords and do simple missions. We'll start off with only the Tyrannozord until we rescue the Tricera and Terra Zords. Now, immediately, this game is incredibly boring because of the loads of tutorials you have to go through. And the game isn't complex as it thinks it is. You can move, jump, and shoot. That's it. You could learn the entire game's mechanics in about five seconds of mashing buttons. But no, you have to walk to a tutorial area, activate it, listen to not Tommy give you instructions, and then you gotta do something simple like collecting coins or shooting targets. It's beyond simple and gets repetitive really quick. Eventually, you will unlock the other Zords. The Terra Zord is fun, I guess. At least it's not hobbling around at a snail's pace. But look what the game has me doing. Flying through rings. I know Superman 64 is like the boomer bad game to be compared to, but literally, what else do you want me to say? It's Superman 64 levels of creativity. Oh, in the Tricera Zord, it's even worse because it can't jump. So you're forced to trudge through the stage and destroy rocks because what else is it good for? When you finish the endless tutorials, the main game isn't any better. You still need to find mission beacons and activate the objective. And the objectives are always one of two tasks. You'll either need to painstakingly collect a bunch of random items or destroy something. That's it. There's no strategy, no exploration, no mix-up from this formula. Every single mission, it's collect this, destroy that, now collect these, and now destroy those. Rinse and repeat. And the icing on top of this crap Sunday easily has to be the voice acting. Two more interference generators to destroy. It literally sounds like the dev team ordered pizza one night and got the driver to record these lines. What's weird is that, like, this is Disney. I totally understand if Saban wanted to be cheap and once again screw the actors out of a payday, but Disney too? I guess it's Power Rangers tradition, unfortunately. Now, I actually persevered to see if the game got any different, and I eventually did reach a full-on Megazord boss battle. Our first Megazord fight on the sixth generation of consoles. And it's trash, blasting endlessly until maybe there's an opening. Cool. This game is bad, a repetitive and uninspired mess that was just thrown out there for the hell of it. It's crazy because whenever I think of licensed GameCube games, I always think of good ones like Shrek 2, Over the Hedge, Spider-Man 1 the movie, the game. All of these are fantastic games, but as usual, Power Rangers gets the short end of the stick. Maybe the GBA version is better. And whose toes do I need to kiss to hear the frickin' Dino Thunder theme? A side-scrolling action game you're legally not allowed to be surprised at anymore. It's not a good one, though. They took after the GameCube game by having endless tutorials and text boxes interrupt the game. The combat's a little slow and there's too much exploration. 
I'd prefer if they just went the Ninja Storm route and focused on making an action game exciting enough to hold my attention. I don't know how to explain it, just look at the two games visually and you can tell the Ninja Storm one is better. As it stands though, the game is... fine. <sighs> can we please just get something different? Power Rangers SPD on the Game Boy Advance. Yet again, it's a side-scrolling action game. This one at least doesn't have any exploration, so it's a bit better. Walk around, beat up the bad guys. Every ranger has a different combo attack and special ability. So, okay, at least there's some variety. What you see is what you get. Beat up the bad guys. Do we at least get to hear the SPD theme? Of course not. Why would we? But what we do get, though, is... Pokemon music? You know what? I'll take it, I guess. Okay, here's something I was actually really excited to play. Power Rangers Super Legends on PlayStation 2. I remember seeing this game on the shelves at video rental stores all the time when I was a kid, but I never had a PS2. So, after 10,000 years, I'm free to finally play the game. The game was released in 2007 and celebrated the 15th anniversary of the show, meaning we have our first ever Power Rangers crossover game. The story follows the Omega Ranger hunting down a revived Lord Zed in a hidden dimension. I really love the art direction here. It's like an animated comic book and works really well for Power Rangers. Lord Zed is somehow revived after the Z-Wave, which surprisingly does get mentioned here. He's in possession of this powerful crystal that lets him hop through dimensions. And we gotta stop him. Level 1 has us playing as... Ugh, the Operation Overdrive team. I guess they were the 15th anniversary team. Weirdly enough, it put me in control of Will, the Black Ranger. I'm not complaining, I'm just surprised you don't play as the Red. And... It's another side-scrolling action game, but let's try and give this one a shot. The combat is pretty fun. You can attack, shoot your blaster, or throw enemies. Mashing the attack button strings together combos pretty fast. For example, you can sure you can them up in the air and also do some aerial combos. My only complaint is that when you knock down an enemy, it takes a million years for them to get back up and continue the fight. And you can't hit them when they're down, so sometimes you spend a lot of time just waiting around and doing nothing. When you're not fighting, you're walking from left to right and platforming. There's a few collectibles and secret areas to explore, but apart from that, the side-scrolling feels very uninspired and pointless. You're pretty much just wasting time until you get into a fight. The game has all the basic staples. Wall jumping, platforming, even a three-year-old can do. The combat really is the glue that's holding this shattered game together. And there are a few cool set pieces I have to compliment. The Rangers encounter Moltor on top of a cliff, where he destroys it, and now we have to do battle standing on this chunk of earth while hurtling down the mountainside. Okay, this is pretty awesome. Eventually, you reach Moltor and have our first boss battle. Nothing too complex. Lay in the combos and step away when he starts to explode. Naturally, after defeating him, it's time for the Megazord battle. Unfortunately, it's once again just a bunch of quick time events, but at least the visuals and cinematography are nice. Red Ranger! The story continues with Will and Mac, not voiced by their actors. Let's see what this stone's about. I wonder how it opens. Being contacted by the Omega Ranger, voiced by Yuri Lowenthal. The repository of all Power Ranger knowledge. My task is to record the exploits of Power Rangers for posterity. He's assembling a team of Rangers throughout all dimensions and universes to stop Lord Zed. However, only two Rangers from each dimension and team can come because that's all the powers can handle. Fine. We then cut to the Lost Galaxy Rangers, who need to save Terra Venture from an attack from Chakina. Also, Leo and Damon are not voiced by their actors. This is getting out of hand. It's way past. After playing level 2 for a little bit, my worst fears came true. All of the rangers play exactly the same from one another. The same punch kick combo, the same blasters, heck they even have the same screen wipe special ability. Like at the very least give them a unique finishing move. So because of this monotony, the game falls off a cliff pretty quickly. 
doing the same exact punches and kicks over and over, and these levels just feel longer. And the levels really aren't that visually stimulating. TerraVenture is literally just this space station for the entire time. And it also took me 30 minutes to complete. That's 30 minutes of walking on this linear path, staring at the same background and occasionally jumping, spending most of the time mashing the X button to punch out the enemies. It's a shame because I really do like the story. I enjoy the multiple dimensions and seeing all the rangers interact with each other. It's not often in Power Rangers history we have a beginning focus on the Operation Overdrive, SPD, and Lost Galaxy team. We haven't even seen a Mighty Morphin Ranger yet. But the gameplay loop is just too boring. The minute and a half cutscene you get in between the hour of this... Ah! isn't worth it, sadly. The game's also co-op, so hey, if you have a friend, maybe you get more mileage out of it. Super Legends also had a DS port, and wow, this is easily the worst Power Rangers game so far. Boring, slow, and ugly. The trifecta of garbage. This would actually be the last Power Rangers game made under Disney. Power Rangers games, along with the show, would kind of go on a hiatus for a little bit. But in 2011, both the show and the games would get a revival. Power Rangers Samurai on Wii. Alright, Power Rangers Samurai is a bit of a mixed bag, but personally, I've always enjoyed it, flaws and all. You start off by picking your ranger. You can choose between... <laughs> excuse me, I've always wanted to do this. Jaden, Mia, Mike, Kevin, Emily... Once you do that, you then have to use the Wiimote to draw the symbol power. Hey, just like in this show, alright! Yes! <laughs> they straight up just use the morphing footage from the show. And honestly, that's perfect, I'm all in. The game's story follows the show, all the way until the end of Season 1, I believe. And what's that? That's enough! We're the Samurai Rangers. That sounds like Jaden! Yeah, they actually hired the actors to voice the characters in the game. I'm shocked. The game has knocked it out of the park so far, and we haven't even gotten to the gameplay yet. The game is a beat-em-up. You walk around the city of New Zealand, I guess. You have a couple of attack options. There's your basic light attack that everyone uses. Swing your spin sword in a combo. And your heavier attack uses the ranger's elements. So Jaden has fire, Mike has wind, etc. For the seemingly millionth time, it's a very simple game. Unlike Super Legends though, I actually prefer this game. The fights are very fast paced and don't last long. The enemies go down after a few hits, so at least you're constantly moving. And the soundtrack is really good. It sounds like background music from the show. Weirdly enough though, I'm surprised the combat doesn't rely more on motion controls. The Wii took every opportunity it could to make you swing that remote. Castlevania, Soul Calibur, all action games on Wii that unintuitively used motion controls. But Power Rangers Samurai is one where I think it would have benefited from having it. I mean, you can see these combos and fights are pretty basic. That's just my opinion though. I love how the game mixes TV show footage and cutscenes. Like, look at this. Sword. Yeah! It's beautiful, really. So I reached the first Megazord fight, and we once again had to swing the remote for symbol power to activate the folding swords. We did that, and uh... What's going on? Is this the Megazord fight? My turn to give it a whirl. Whoa! Chew on this! It was! The first Megazord fight is literally told via visual novel. Eventually, I did reach another one, and it's a bit better, I guess. It's once again just more quick time events. Swing the remote or nunchuck like it's Guitar Hero. Cool. Overall, I'd say the game does more good than bad. It's a fun and simple action game. There's co op, scenes from the show, you get to hear the actors' actual voices, and the music. For a TV licensed game, especially one on Wii, I can't hate it too much. There is a certain charm it has. If you were a kid during this time, I could see why this may be your favorite game of all time. Rangers together! Samurai forever! 
Now hold on, this samurai train ain't done yet, because we have Power Rangers Super Samurai on Xbox 360. The game uses the Kinect, and since I don't have either of those things, you just have to watch trailer footage over and over, I'm sorry. From what I can tell though, it's just every Kinect game. Move your arms around and beat up Moogers. I can't imagine this game is very responsive at all. Just watching footage of someone playing it at a demo, it looks incredibly frustrating and busted. Although, if you're six, I guess you wouldn't mind and would just be happy controlling a ranger. Maybe that's the audience. I doubt it. Once again, the Wii tramples the Xbox. Oh god, just stop it right there. Power Rangers Mega Force on 3DS. Arguably the worst season in the show's history brings us one of the most boring games. I wouldn't say worst. The game isn't bad necessarily. It isn't mechanically broken or frustratingly difficult. It's once again, you know, I'm not even going to say it. The OG Game Boy was released in 1989, and despite 24 years of technological advancements and evolutions in gaming, Power Rangers on handhelds have stayed exactly the same. Side-scrolling beat-em-ups. But I do have an interesting fact about this game. Andrew Gray, who played Troy in the show, didn't voice his character. You know who did? Be careful, there's something there, and we're gonna take you down! That's Johnny Young Bosch. Bro, that's the wrong Power Rangers actor! Troy never sounded this cool. Well, Megaforce's entire gimmick was the legendary battle and the legendary rangers, so there you go. Adam kind of made an appearance in Megaforce. We're gonna move on to Super Mega Force on 3DS, because it's the exact same game as Mega Force, but with a few extra things. So I'll kill two birds with one stone, and talk about the mechanics and gameplay here. You start off by selecting two rangers, one you'll control and the other one controlled by the CPU. You go around and mash the attack button over and over again. To my surprise though, every ranger does have unique attacks. Orion uses the spear, Troy swings his sword, Noah uses dual blades, Jake throws bombs, making him the worst character. Seriously, you can't attack properly at all, just throwing bombs. Since there's a delay, you have to just hope the enemy just runs into it. Emma uses her blaster, and Gia has these boomerang things. So, okay, that's the one plus I'll give this game. Playing as different rangers will give you a different experience. But the character select screen is really what caught my eye. There's a lot of unlockable characters here. And since this is the big Legendary War season, you can unlock past rangers. I looked it up, and you can play as the Megaforce rangers, the Mighty Morphin rangers, and the Red Ranger from every season up to this point. A bit of a cop-out, but I'll take Forever Red too. You can unlock these rangers in two different ways. One way is scanning a ranger key, a toy that sold separately. This. It's kind of a smart move. I mean, I have plenty of Gokaiger keys, but I don't have any of the Megaforce ones, so that's not gonna work. So the only other option is to complete in-game achievements. You'll unlock legendary rangers throughout the game by either completing stages or defeating a certain amount of enemies. For example, if you want to play as Tommy as the green or white ranger, you need to defeat 2,000 enemies. And may I remind you, this is the game. It's not a warrior's game where you fight hordes of enemies. Every stage has like, maybe 15 enemies. You'll be here for a while. I eventually unlocked Nick, the Red Mystic Force Ranger, mainly to see if he would play differently. And... He does. His attack patterns and special abilities are all unique. So, alright. I will give it credit. Maybe it is worth sinking in thousands of hours to unlock all the characters but probably not. In the mid-2010s, there was a bit of a Mighty Morphin revival. Partly with the new live-action movie coming into prominence, fans both old and new would come out and show their love for the Power Rangers. So in 2017, we would get Mighty Morphin Power Rangers Mega Battle on Xbox One and PS4. However, another major factor in this Mighty Morphin revival came in the form of the comic books. In 2016, Boom Studios would revive slash relaunch the Power Rangers universe in a brand new comic series. I've actually never gotten around to reading a single issue yet, but I vaguely know a tiny bit. 
the comics go for a more serious route in terms of storytelling. It seems to appeal more to the now adult fans who grew up with the TV show. It also follows a bit of the TV show's lore and continuity, but goes on its own path where they feel like they could do better. For example, I believe in the comics Jason, Zack, and Trini still leave the Mighty Morphin team, but instead of going on a vague peace conference trip, they actually get promoted to lead a new team of rangers to fight evil in space. Or something? Again, I haven't read the comics. Now, why am I going over all this? Well, because Mega Battle seems to take some inspiration from said comics, at least in its art direction. Rita, the Rangers, Zordon, Alpha, they're all sporting a new sleek and muscular look, which is honestly super refreshing. The game is another arcade-style beat-em-up. Walk around, beat up putties, more, fight the monster, you know the drill. Something about the in-game sprites feels... off. I don't know, it looks kinda cheap, like a mix between Brawlhalla and an online Flash game in 2004. No life in their faces, the walking animation feels stilted, and the combat is once again incredibly basic and monotonous. After Megaforce on 3DS, there weren't any Power Rangers game released on consoles or handhelds, so at the time this felt like a real treat. The cutscenes, cinematic, and background music would get any Power Rangers fan hyped, but the gameplay is still just kinda boring. There needs to be more than just punches and kicks. Like, I personally think that the Scott Pilgrim game is boring mechanically, but its art style, music, minigames, and overall charm the game has keeps it beloved in people's minds. Mega Battle, though, just feels lifeless through and through. It's literally the same problem Super Legends had back on the PS2. A fun universe with an engaging story and cutscenes, but the gameplay loses its steam very quickly. Now hey, as a Power Rangers fan, again, we don't have many options. It's still a fun enough beat-em-up if you can get three friends together. I like how you can choose between the Season 1 and 2 Rangers, like selecting Jason or Rocky. That's cute. I don't want it to sound like I hate this game, because I really don't. It's just, I want better for the franchise I love so much. 90% of these games have been beat-em-ups, and that's fine, but most of them feel very lifeless and rushed. The game would eventually be delisted for whatever reason, so you can't even play it nowadays unless you have an Xbox or PS4 with it already downloaded. However, in 2019, we get our first Big Feel Power Rangers game in a long time. Power Rangers Battle for the Grid. Damn, this artwork is so sick. The game actually feels like a high-quality, high-budget AAA game. The art direction is incredible. What we have is a 2D fighting game featuring rangers from all across the Rangerverse. It is so satisfying seeing characters like the Magna Defender and Jen with these modern day graphics. Everyone looks so clean and seeing their special moves feel like such a treat. Hold it right there. Eat fire. I'm not someone who's necessarily good at fighting games like at all, but I was still able to string together a lot of satisfying combos. I'd honestly say this is one of the most accessible fighting games ever released. I've heard fighting game fans say the game has an emphasis on ground attacks, as opposed to other games where you can launch the opponent in the air and do crazy button inputs to the point where you can KO them without even touching the ground, which sounds impossible for someone like me to pull off, so I'm all for this game's fairly simple structure. Every face button does an attack and pointing the joystick in a certain direction will change that attack and allow for combos. To my untrained eye, every character felt viable. There wasn't one that particularly felt more overpowered than the other. The Magna Defender has slow but heavy attacks, Udana requires more creativity with how to link your combos together, and Jason is your straightforward fighter. Now, what really had me hooked throughout my entire experience with Battle for the Grid was its story mode. The story seems to follow the comics, which again, I'm not really familiar with, so I apologize if I make some mistakes. The story follows Lord Draken, who is Tommy. To my knowledge, in the comic book universe, Rita once again had Tommy under her spell, turning him into an evil ranger that wielded both the green and white ranger powers. Lord Draken is sinister and serious, I believe even killing some rangers in the comics. In the game, he's voiced by Jason David Frank, and it gives me chills hearing him portray this darker version of Tommy. Zordon chose children for a reason. Their hope, their optimism, but also their naivete. Their ability to be controlled. They must grow up. He ends up stabbing and killing Rita, wanting to be the ultimate ruler himself where he then heads to the, 
I guess, prime dimension we all know and love. I love how we start with the dark and serious Lord Draken and immediately cut to our universe's Tommy, who's being silly, making puns, and flirting with Kimberly. We have a couple of fights to get us used to the controls, and goodness gracious, the CPU does not mess around. Look at this, the CPU is infinitely comboing me in the corner. May I remind you, this is the second fight in the game. Eventually, Lord Draken shows up and seemingly kills Tommy, but Jen was right on his tail and sends him fleeing momentarily. Zordon calls for an SOS, warning rangers across all timelines and universes about this new threat. Lord Draken is apparently stealing rangers' morphers and siphoning their power for himself. With this power, he's also created an army of Mastodon sentries. This is probably explained more in the comics, but they seem to be modeled and built after the Black Ranger. The power axe being transformed into an assault rifle, and the powers being mass-produced as soldiers. So with that, the mission for all Power Rangers is now very simple. Survive. The game's story mode structure is similar to other fighting games like Mortal Kombat and Injustice. However, I think Battle for the Grid handles it in a much better way. For those who don't know, in a modern Mortal Kombat story mode, the game puts you in control of a character, and you play as them for about an hour or two. But because of this structure, the fights end up being limited. If I'm playing as good guy Johnny Cage, then all of my fights need to be with low-tier jobbers. Thus, you end up smacking around Baraka and Reptile a million times devaluing them as characters. I love those story modes, but from an in-universe perspective, it sucks seeing some characters take a beating over and over because how else are we gonna do it? Here though, the character you're in control of is constantly changing. For example, I was playing as Gia for a round, defending myself from the Mastodon Sentry and whooping its butt. After doing that though, a new villain was introduced, the Ranger Slayer. I believe she's an alternate universe Kimberly that serves Lord Draken and, well, slays rangers. Now, I was honestly expecting me to still play as Gia and beat up this new threat, but no. I immediately then took control of the Ranger Slayer and captured Gia. Because the character you're playing as is constantly changing, the story gets to play out without feeling dragged out. If the bad guy needs to win in the story, you play as the bad guy. You take control of Lord Draken a good bit pretty early on in the game. I mean, he's a conquering villain, so why wouldn't he ever get his hands dirty from the beginning? The story kind of drags towards the middle. It mainly follows different rangers being ambushed and fighting back. The only real jobbers in the story mode are the Mastodon Sentries and Goldar. From what I can tell though, the Sentries are a group of people and not just a single person, so them constantly getting whooped makes sense from a story perspective. Sorry Goldar, no excuse for you. Rangers from all universes start getting captured. We catch up with our main team, Jason, Kimberly, Jen, and Lauren? This is what I love about the game. The TV show, more often than not, does not show a lot of love to characters. So the fact that Lauren gets to be front and center here is pretty charming. Sure, Jason is leading the resistance, but at least he's voiced by Austin St. John. Jen, you and Kim pick up whatever rangers you can. Make sure you take Trini. She's been working on some new armor upgrades that may come in handy. So if the Mighty Morphin Red Ranger needs to be the leader, at least they got the OG actor. Trini eventually joins the battle, and Jesus, what is that? This is probably a good time to talk about the roster. No, not every ranger is playable in this game, but I think the base game selection is a good one. For example, we do have every Mighty Morphin Ranger color available, but it's not what you think. Jason, Tommy, and Kimberly are all the core rangers with their basic abilities. Trini is here though, rocking in a freaking dinosaur mech suit, which is amazing. She apparently built it herself, I love her so much. The aforementioned Mastodon Sentry takes the place of the Black Ranger, and Billy is here! Yeah, Billy from the 2017 movie. I was not expecting that. The rest of the Rangers are more unique ones. Gia with her whip swords, Cat and her animal-like offense, Jen because she's perfect and I love her. There's apparently lots of other DLC characters, but I'm not gonna talk about that, just the core game. The story mode does eventually kinda dip after a while. You're essentially just doing non-stop fight after fight with not enough cutscenes interspersed. The Rangers realize they need Dr. K's help. However, Corinth is under attack and she refuses to leave it vulnerable. Which actually makes a lot of sense if you know the story of RPM. I won't go over every story beat. There's a lot of small details Ranger fans will adore. The last thing I will mention though is Jason's speech. He gathers all remaining rangers for one last stand against Lord Draken's forces. And it's honestly super powerful. This whole game is just a small taste of what Power Rangers could be if it kinda took itself seriously. We have all put aside our lives. 
for a chance to do the right thing. But we fight together. Whether we stand or whether we fall, we are the Power Rangers! Power Rangers! Overall, Battle for the Grid is a great addition to the Power Rangers library of games. Even people who aren't fans of the series could get something out of this gameplay-wise. It looks great, plays great, and it's a game that wasn't afraid to be different and tell a more serious story, and have a focus on more than just the Mighty Morphin team. I was kinda hoping this game would be a bit of a jumping off point for more serious Power Rangers games. Maybe an RPG, an action game? Who knows. All we can do is keep our fingers crossed. You saved reality and showed what it truly means to be a Power Ranger. In every dimension, in every era, there will be those who seek to do harm. And while we can't anticipate those threats, I am confident now more than ever, that the universe is in good hands. You have my thanks. And may the power protect you all. Alright, now we have a couple of games to talk about released on phones! Oh wow, fantastic, I can't wait! I'm not gonna cover these in any particular order. First up is Power Rangers Legacy Wars. This is the only one still available in the App Store. All the other games were delisted and removed forever. Thanks. Legacy War is kind of like the mobile version of Battle for the Grid, but it has a couple of... interesting choices. The combat is unique. You can move left and right like in a fighting game. However, your attacks are limited and have cooldowns, so you can't just mash your attack buttons. I guess this is one way to make the game viable on your phone, but ultimately I feel like it kind of just slows down the experience. If you do your two attacks, you're now just standing there waiting for your attack to finish charging. But because of that, the game also does require more strategy and thinking. It's more like chess. You can't just go in there and mash buttons hoping to win. There has to be a bit of strategy. The main thing I dislike about this game is that after the tutorials, it's strictly PvP, meaning you're only able to play with actual humans. Humans who have probably been playing this game since day one and will absolutely floor you every single time. I can't imagine the active player base for this game is huge, so you'll just be fighting the same people with maxed out rangers who can read your every move. It's a fun enough game though. Visually it's very beautiful, and is that Krispy Kreme? Everything else is your typical mobile game experience. Collect random items to unlock new rangers, probably get frustrated and end up dumping some real life money into the game to unlock the really good characters. Alright, let's move on. To Power Rangers Dash. No way. Alright, yes way. The game is an auto-runner. You can either jump or attack depending on whether there's a pit or an enemy in front of you. That's it. Auto-runners are meant to be as simple as simple can be. Although, to be fair, the game does look like a total Russian bootleg. I don't know what it is. The weird Chibi Rangers, the Comic Sans text appearing on screen, the generic royalty-free music. This whole game just screams, we don't care. You'll start off with three rangers, and every time you get hit, you'll lose one. Lose all three, and the game's over. You can eventually summon a Megazord power-up that makes you invincible. The only downside is that it makes the game lag like crazy and makes my phone feel like it's about to explode at any second. Power Rangers Dino Charge Rumble The rangers head down into the subway, just in time to rescue Chase. Take this! Oh man, and I thought the last game looked like a bootleg. What is this? Is this seriously official? Everything about this looks so devoid of life and passion. Bland backgrounds, everyone has the same idol animations, everything meets the bare minimum requirements to call this a game. It's just a turn-based action game. Select an attack and swipe on the screen because it's a phone game! Rinse and repeat. <laughs> Come on, Dino Charge was literally the only good season in the 2010s, and in return we get this janky looking garbage? Power Rangers Unite. It's, uh, it's a card game. I hate card games. Next! Alright, here's Power Rangers All-Stars. From what I can tell, the game is some kind of... dungeon crawler? Wait, that sounds amazing! 
Pick your team of rangers, explore an area, gather treasures, and defeat the enemies. The attack seems to be on a cooldown system, but this actually seems like loads of fun, and it's a genre that Power Rangers hasn't really explored yet. But now that I'm seeing it right in front of me, of course a dungeon crawling Power Rangers game sounds genius. Hell, if Minecraft can do it, why not the Power Rangers? You can unlock all different kinds of rangers with unique abilities, different megazords from across all the series. Like, dude, this actually sounds like something I would have been into and maybe even dropped a few bucks in. Of course, by the time I was working on this video, the game was long delisted from the App Store. Great, of course I missed out on this. But if you think that's bad, how about a Power Rangers game that had a soft launch and was cancelled before it was even released? Well, that was the case for Power Rangers Morphin Legends. And damn, look at that title screen. Loads of color and fantastic art. The game would have been an RPG in the Power Rangers universe, complete with dialogue, characters from all across the universe, and a seemingly competent turn-based battle system. It was made by the same team that made Battle for the Grid and Legacy Wars. They clearly have a passion for the series, and can make some incredibly high-quality games. As I mentioned earlier though, Morphin Legends had a soft launch, which I believe means there was a playable demo you could download in 2022, but for whatever reason in 2023, when it was meant to be released, the game was just outright cancelled. There was clearly a lot of effort put into this game, and I really hope we can get a full release... eventually. For crying out loud, a Power Rangers RPG would probably fix 95% of my life's problems. But with that, marks the final official Power Rangers game. At least at the time of this recording. As I'm editing this, Rita's Rewind isn't out yet and still doesn't have a release date and depending on how long this video takes to work on, I may or may not include it here. If I don't, then I'll just have to make a dedicated video for that game, so be on the lookout. Maybe. There's also some more mobile games scheduled to be released in late 2024. They look like garbage card games, so I'm not interested. Now, despite us reaching the end of our official Power Rangers games list, the video still isn't over. Because in classic Connor the Waffle fashion, we're gonna check out some Power Rangers fan games and bootlegs. Heck yeah, throwback! First game on our list is simply titled... Power Rangers. At least I know we're in the right place. You get to pick between your favorite iconic childhood rangers, such as the Red Hawk, Blue Swallow, Yellow Owl, Black Condor, and White Swan. No wait, that don't sound right. The game is a side-scrolling action game and... Wait, this looks, feels, sounds, and plays like a proper NES game. What's going on? Well, if it wasn't obvious, this isn't a Power Rangers game. The 15th team of Super Sentai was known as Jetman. It was the Sentai that debuted before Zhu Ranger, aka Mighty Morphin. Apparently though, at some point, Jetman was considered and was supposed to be the original Sentai that would be adapted into Power Rangers. So in a weird way, this game being named Power Rangers is fitting. As you could probably guess, this is just an official Jetman game released on the Famicom in Japan. Like every NES game, it's simple, but gets the job done. Pick your ranger, move from left to right, and beat up the bad guys. The red and black ranger have swords, the blue and white have blasters, and the yellow ranger has their fist. So even back in the day, choosing a different ranger gives you a different experience. At the end of every stage, there's a Megazord battle. Since the NES only has two buttons though, the combat is incredibly basic. I was just mashing the attack button as fast as I could to punch this thing until I won. I don't know if there's any strategy to implement. You can't block or do special moves, at least to my knowledge. So this is the only way to win, I guess. It's honestly a really solid game. Simple side-scrolling NES game. Hell, they even had a cutscene for the Megazord transformation. We're off to a good start. Alright, up next we got... Power Rangers 2, also on the NES. The story is, uh... Rita. She's feeling it. She's having a conversation with... Someone's grandpa. The game is once again another side-scrolling platformer, because what else would it be? This one, though, is a little more rough. You'll start off with your blaster, which plays fine, but eventually you unlock the power daggers, and these are probably the worst weapons I've ever played with in a video game ever. 
They swipe in two different directions every time. You attack left, and then right. Left, and then right. Every single time. This means if there's an enemy on your right, you need to let out an attack before attempting to land your real attack. You see how stupid that sounds? The first boss was... Finster? Alright, that's different. I genuinely couldn't figure out what to do. None of my attacks were landing, and I was probably missing most of them because of this stupid attack pattern. And I'm trying to hit these little floor monsters, but they're impossible to attack. This game is so ass, what were they thinking? This was another official Geo Ranger game released in Japan. And honestly, I wish it stayed there. Alright, Power Rangers 3 on NES, and oh wow, look at this! This actually looks like Power Rangers. You can play as the main five teens. Jason, Zack, Trini, Billy, and... Kinbiali. Oh my god. So what we have here is a demake of Mighty Morphin on Super Nintendo. And it's awful. The gameplay is monotonous since there's no combos, the hit detection sucks, and this music, I swear to whoever is listening, I'm going to go insane. It's so awful. It actually plays more like the Game Gear games. Putties jump in the screen and you gotta fight them until the boss shows up. The first boss is Cyclopsis, the final boss from the SNES game. And why is he so tiny? Anyway, this is really where the frustration set in. He can do these combos and shoot a projectile your way, and all you can do is swing your weapon and jump around. Like, why can't I do any of this stuff? So, I lost. And I don't care. Now we have Mighty Morphin Power Rangers The Movie... 4. Now don't get too excited with this 10 character select screen, because it's all the same 5 rangers with different portraits. The characters costumes don't change color. So, what's the point? Oh, hell no, you have got to be kidding! It is literally, and I do mean literally, the exact same game as the last. Not a single thing has changed, why would you do this? Well, luckily for us, that's the last Power Rangers bootleg game I could get my hands on, but let's end things on a high. Go, go, Power, Rangers! Power Rangers Beats of Power. It's pretty much the perfect Power Rangers experience. The story follows Lord Zed and Rita taking over the world, following bits and pieces from the show and using actual music and screenshots. You can pick your ranger, the core 5 plus Tommy as the white ranger. But here's a secret, if you keep pressing right on the select screen, you can secretly select Tommy as the green ranger. The game is a full on 4 player arcade style beat em up. Yes, this is all I've ever wanted. Beats of Power is like a hybrid of the best 16 bit Power Rangers games. It clearly takes inspiration from the Genesis movie game. Hell, most of the stages are straight up just ripped from that game, but takes the polish and excitement from the Super Nintendo game. Playing as the Ranger in their human form, stringing together combos, and morphing halfway through the stage. Now, while the game does take inspiration from the Genesis game, it isn't a one to one recreation. Level 1, for example, ends with us at the Juice Bar, which didn't make an appearance in the Genesis one. There's also this nifty Dark Souls roll, making the gameplay feel really fast and dynamic. You can lay in some combos and roll away when the enemy starts to do an attack. This makes the game feel very fair, which is usually the antithesis of what an arcade beat em up is supposed to be. As I mentioned earlier, the best parts of the game are easily the use of the actual footage and music from the show. The background music in each stage is a Ron Wasserman track, the characters have the hey with every strike, and the morphing is ripped straight from the show. And it all blends together really well. It doesn't feel tacky or intrusive in my opinion. Naturally, after defeating the stage boss, they grow big and it's time for the Megazord fight. And even this is four players! You can select between the Dinozord, Dragonzord, Thunderzord, and Tigerzord. This is where I really fanboyed. Seven total playable characters and four Megazords so everyone can play the entire time together. 
When you select your Megazord, you even get to watch the sequence in all of its 144p glory. It's so hype, seeing the transformation sequence and immediately being back in control to beat up the monster, all while the Ron Wasserman music is still playing in the background. The only negative I have to say about the game is level 3. You start off the game platforming on this very narrow bridge. The slightest move will have you fall off and lose an entire life. I'm playing on easy, so I had 30 lives. Normally though, you only have 5. And there's no continues, so you could lose every life very quickly if you're not careful and need to start over from the beginning, which can feel like a bit of a drag. That's my only complaint though, the rest of the game is beyond perfect and satisfying for any Power Rangers fan. And again, being 4 players really is the icing on the cake. Now there is another fan game that, at the time of this recording, isn't out yet. Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, it's Morphin Time. It's another 4 player arcade style beat em up, but with original sprites and level designs. As well as a lot of modern polish. Beats of Power is obviously loads of fun, but it's heavily inspired and modeled after the SNES and Genesis games. This one seems to be built from the ground up for the most part. From what I can tell, there's loads of fun and insane combos that'll keep the game fresh and exciting. I've been following the game's progress for a while now, and I'm excited to play it when it's out. This isn't sponsored by the way, I'm just a fan who's genuinely excited. So if you want to follow this project, follow at Pop Hero Games and tell them Connor the Waffle sent you, and that he wants to play your game. But with all of that, we've reached the end of our Power Rangers video game adventure. It was definitely a mixed bag. Some good, and some bad. The games, while fun, definitely started to get stagnant towards the middle and end there. I don't have a problem with simplicity, but there needs to be some excitement and flair to keep people interested. That's why I'm excited for Rita's Revenge. It looks like they added in a ton of features to keep you engaged. But let me know your favorite Power Rangers game down below. And until next time, may the power protect you. Nintendo Power.